national conservatism is dead. And it was a very sassy rant from David Harsani, who is the senior editor over at The Federalist. And just so you can get a sense of the tone, the first sentence states, since a civil war is about to break out and destroy the modern Republican Party, fingers crossed, let me tell you what grinds my gears. And it went from there. And I love the tone. I think I agree with him on so many issues. He joins us now via Skype. David Harsani, thank you so much. Happy early Thanksgiving. <laughs> Thank you. I've never been called sassy before. So, Thank yeah, you. I was trying to think of I'm like, you're not really a curmudgeon because you take too much joy in, in some of this. But I thought that this was a really interesting piece over an issue that I think is widely, I don't want to say discouraged, maybe avoided uh, kind of in within the right. This issue of national conservatism or <laughs> this national conservatism issue and this push to really kind of be in many respects it's somewhat indistinguishable from the left and how government in, is used and things are, are applied. Um, give us a little thought on this because you ignited a very big uh, discussion on social media over zombie Reaganism, which, you know, I, I loved the shining city on the hill. I agree with you. I mean, it actually did mean something and there were some things that were accomplished under that. Yeah, I mean, it's a big topic. I think that in general, um, what I'm talking about is the economic policy, first of all, where you're trying to compete in growing government and welfare programs and giving people checks and helping them in ways that uh, don't really help them in the long term, but just essentially give them some sort of entitlement. You're never going to beat the Dems or liberals in general on that front. They're always going to offer more. They're always going to be willing to spend more money. So it, it's, it's a fool's game, but it's also the wrong policy. It's not going to help people as we've seen. Now, a lot of these NatCon folks are, you know, very pro-family. I'm pro-family. And they think that this will help families of the working class and perhaps middle class. But we know that welfare and welfare checks and welfare programs have done more to destroy communities and destroy families than perhaps any government program that we've ever had. Right. So I don't understand where they're coming from in that way. Yeah. And then just lastly, I think they combine the idea that we need to be or that the right needs to have a stiffer spine and be more like Trump in that sense with these programs that are not really, uh, you know, don't really have a wide appeal. I agree that Trump stiffened the spine of the Republican Party in many ways, in good ways, but I don't think that the populist econ stuff where you're chasing around a, a very narrow group of people is, is the right way to go. Exactly. And the whole family leave proposal the paid family leave, which I've seen a lot proposed on the right, that actually shocks me. I have to tell you, this was probably about a year ago. I did, uh, I taped a, a podcast interview and, you know, I, gen I have a good opinion of the individual. I don't want to, you know, start a flame war or name them or try to shame them or anything, but it was, it's a young NatCon and they had a, you know, fairly influential, they're, I mean, you know, them, they're fairly influential. Uh, and the question that came up was whether or not we should pay people to have kids in the United States so that we could avoid having to rely upon, uh, I guess, the labor of people coming into the country. And I was just sort of shocked at that because I thought we already provided that in the form of welfare. And it hasn't been incredibly successful. And that was sort of my response. And I had said on air, I kind of felt like Obi-Wan Kenobi when he was yelling at Anakin as he was smoldering there on Mustafar. And he was like, it should, it was supposed to be you. And I was looking at someone who was very influential as a young Republican, and I'm thinking, what are you doing? It's supposed to be you. Why are you going this Rick Santorum, you know, big government route? Why did this become a popular thing? How did this get to take root in the Republican part or the conservative sphere even? It's a good question. I, I, I think that what happened was people feel like they're always losing. And in a democratic system, you often feel like you're losing because you're never really fully winning, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I, and they just said, listen, we have to just act like them. We have to do what they're doing. That's the only way to win. That's the only way to fight back. Neutral principles don't really matter when the other side, you know, is is doesn't care about. That sounds them. like and, surrender. Yeah, to me it does. I mean, you know, I have the principles I have, and I became a sort of Reagan, you know, you know, a small L libertarianish conservative because I believe in the principles un underlying them. I don't just change. I can't just. I don't want to sound like I'm some um, monk or something, but I can't just change them up because, you you know, we've lost a couple of elections or right. whatever. That doesn't make any sense. I believe in those ideas, not just because I think they can win office, but because I think they're good for the country. Right. But I also think they can win office. I think like you just mentioned, you know, Reagan's vision. And I don't want to bring Reagan up specifically. I'm talking about the ideas that that, that brought that fusionist movement together 
were good ones. They're appealing ones to people. I think middle class people want to be left alone for the most part. I think they want good schools. I think they want choices. And, uh, you know, yeah. so, yeah, that's why I support those ideas. I think you raise a good point, too, because whenever and I can't remember who initially said this, and I've co- totally co-opted it and have a, you know bridged it and abused it six ways to Sunday on air. Something to the effect of if you know you get if, if a voter has to choose between a fake Democrat or a real one, they're going to pick the real one. And it, it does seem like surrender if you're trying to, well, the only way we can beat them is if we become them. Well, then you've just lost. You've just thrown in the towel. That, that You haven't beaten them at all. They've beaten you if you think that you have to go down to that. It's like using the government, certain, I think NACONs think that using the government is more, it's okay because their ideas somehow are for a more virtuous purpose. But 100%. that's like the Lord of the Rings one ring argument. I mean, it's still going to, you know, you're, it's still going to corrupt you. No, you, you, you hit it on the head. Their intellectual movement says basically that you, if you use government for virtuous reasons, it's okay to use it and compel people to do things. First of all, you mentioned like paying people to have kids. Anyone who has kids knows you don't have kids because someone's going to send you a thousand dollar check. Kids are going to make you poor. <laughs> it doesn't matter what you're going to do for middle class people, sending your kid to college, things like that. Those things need to be reformed so that people can afford to have kids and not be on welfare and not have to rely on the state. And also the state crowds out churches. The state crowds out charity and community. Uh, this is why we should be pushing federalism. Florida is a great example of that. Um, so, you know, I, I you had that experience. I had this similar experience where I was at CPAC, I think 2019 or something like that. And some first uh, first things magazine editor was speaking and he said something like, we just have too much freedom in this country or too many choices. And I'm like, that's crazy. And then everyone got up and cheered who were there, a lot of young people. And I was like, this is weird. Sometimes I think maybe because I'm a Gen X or, you know, like I, I don't understand that generation, but but or they're looking for something new that they think is new, maybe. Yeah. And that's, and I, it's really and you just want to go back and like play him some of the quote unquote compassionate conservatism speeches. Be like, really, right. this is new. You think this? Let's play this from you know George Bush in two thousand or you know Rick or, Santorum. Or Buchanan, right? right go yeah, back. go back to be exactly, exactly. Talking to David Harsani with the Federalist. My last question for you. So, it, looking ahead at twenty twenty four, which I really don't want to do before you know the holidays, particularly. But here we are. Uh, that we didn't get a choice in that. That all kicked off. How is this going to define? 2024 because you brought up florida and you know not to throw rick DeSantis or rick DeSantis. what am i doing ron DeSantis out there before it's too early i mean he did that is a very good example of you know how florida how it was you know he handled everything from lockdown to pandemic even with the situation with disney i think that there was a lot of debate um over whether or not you know the state should be giving you know breaks and accommodations special ones that regular people don't get to corporations etc cetera, etc cetera. long story short though is 2024 going to kind of be like a head-to-head competition, you think, or, or a matchup between that sort of NatCon versus the, you know, the small, the lowercase l conservatism? I think actually Ron DeSantis can bring those two together more than any candidate I can think of because he, ha- he does have sort of the disposition of a NatCon kind of person. But in my opinion, he was very, very small government in many ways. The ways he did intrude on government gave people more freedom to do the things that they wanted. I have no no problem with that, right? I think that when you talk about cronyism, for instance, they yeah, it seems to me like NatCons want to get involved and then sort of they want to be the technocrats, right? But yeah. I think the best thing is to separate those two things, and then then corporations won't have power over you. And I think that's what uh, Ron DeSantis, I almost, says Rick, I almost said Rick DeSantis too. I know, Where, what is happening with us? It's a Friday, I don't know. It's it's crazy, but we anyway, don't know. So yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I find, I, to me, he seems like a real traditional conservative who maybe is more aggressive in, in certain ways that we, we need them to be aggressive. So I don't know what's gonna happen, but if he wants uh, a fight there, I, I think he, he can do well. You never know how this translates nationally, but I think he's, he's a pretty uh, a, a figure that a lot of conservatives would like. Yeah, I agree, completely agree. Well, this is a great piece. David Harsani with The Federalist, and of course, it's national conservatism is a dead, is, is a dead end, which I believe um, entirely. It's, it's it, hopefully it'll go away. We'll see, I don't know, it's just a creepy time. I feel like I'm living in a children of the corn era. I don't even know, it's just weird. David Harsani, always good to see you. Happy Thanksgiving. Thanks so much. You too. Thank you.